Hey everybody, it's David. So today's going to be another research themed video from the Coolwoods Laboratory. And specifically, I'm going to give you a breakdown of one of the more technical concepts in extracellular planetary science, and that is a technique known as astrodensity profiling. If you've not heard of this technique before, I'm not surprised. It's one of the more specialized tools that exoplanet astronomers use, and it's only really proliferated the exoplanet literature in the last sort of five years or so. So what is it? At its very core, we can define astrodensity profiling as being comparing the density of a star as measured from the shape of a transit light curve versus some independent measure. Starting with the independent measurement of a stellar density, there are all sorts of ways that astronomers can use to get a handle as to what the density of a star is. We can use information such as the color of a star, its spectrum, and even the pulsations of a star to nail down this parameter. But in this video, I'm gonna focus a bit more on that former term, the transit light curve derived stellar density. I think it's pretty unintuitive to initially think that the passage of a planet in front of a star would somehow tell you what the mean density of that star is. But hopefully I can convince you it's really not that hard and I'm going to break it down to you here as to how this works. When a planet passes in front of a star as viewed from our perspective, we call this a transit and it looks like a characteristic dip in the brightness of a star for a short amount of time. To first order this brightness dip, this transit, tells us two properties. It tells us the depth of the transit and it tells us the width of the transit, the duration of the transit. The depth of the transit is pretty easy to work out. It's basically the area of the planet's disk divided by the area of the star's disk. So that's just really telling us how big is this planet. Now the duration of the transit is a bit trickier to do. So to simplify things, let's imagine that the planet traverses along the equator of the star. So the time it takes the planet to go from one side of the star to the other is going to be the distance divided by velocity. In this case, the distance the planet has to traverse is the diameter of the star itself, or equivalently twice the radius of the star. So now we have to divide that by the speed. How fast is the planet moving? That's also not so hard to do either, as long as we're willing to assume that the planet travels on a circular orbit around its star. If we sort of zoom out to a bird's eye view of this planet's orbit, it's a bit easier to see how we can calculate this velocity. Velocity is a distance divided by a time. And in this case, we know both of those things. The distance the planet has to travel to make one complete orbital period is exactly one circumference of its orbit. Now, if you remember your geometry, that's basically just two pi, multiplied by the radius of the orbit, which let's use the symbol a here. So we have the distance and how long does it take? What is the time for one orbital period? Well, that's just one year. Let's use the letter P to describe that. So finally, coming back to our transit, we now know that the distance the planet has to traverse is twice the radius of the star and the velocity is two pi a over P. So we can actually solve for the duration now. We can actually write down that the duration of a planetary transit is going to be p over pi divided by a over r star. So notice how I sort of group some of those terms together and that a over r star term is really important. By simply measuring the time difference between consecutive transits, we can always measure the orbital period fairly easily. And of course, we can also measure the transit duration just by looking at the duration of the transit. So the only thing we don't know in this equation is a over r star. Or another way of saying that is that we can actually solve for a over r star by rearranging this equation. Okay, so step one complete. We now know what a over r star is. But I promised you I would tell you what the density of a star is, not a over r star. But don't fret, it's actually really easy now to convert from this a over r star number into the mean density of that star. And the magic by which we do this is Kepler's third law. If we use Isaac Newton's version of Johannes's Kepler's third law, we can actually write down that the mass of a star can be figured out just based on its orbital radius and its orbital period. The equation looks like this, and if you've done any algebra before, you're probably able to figure out how to use this equation. It's really just using squared and cubed terms at the most complicated level, that's it. Okay, so this is great. Kepler's third law would allow me to measure the mass of a star if I knew the orbital period and I knew the orbital radius. I definitely do know the orbital period of transiting planets, as we said before. That's just the timing between consecutive events. So do I know the orbital radius of the planet? Mm, not quite. I know the orbital radius of the planet divided by the radius of the star. 
A over R star. In general, we don't actually know what the radii of stars are, so we can't just convert this into A by itself. Instead, since we have A over R star, let's divide by R star on the other side of Kepler's equation. In fact, we really have to divide by the radius of the star cubed on both sides in order to get that A over R star term on the right-hand side. Now look at this. What happens is you get a term on the left-hand side, which is a mass divided by a radius cubed. Now, if you remember any geometry, this might start to look familiar. The volume of a sphere, such as a star, is 4 thirds pi r cubed. So you can see that term on the bottom left there is almost the volume of a star. So we can make it a volume of a star just by dividing by 4 thirds pi on both sides. So hey presto, what do you need to know? We've actually been able to measure now the density of a star based on the duration of a transit and the time difference between transits. To me, this is a really cute piece of little physics. I mean, you have taken measurements in units of time, of like seconds and days, and you have somehow been able to convert that into a density, which is like, you know, kilograms per meter cubed. So it really is unintuitive why this should work, but hopefully I've convinced you that we can do this. So to get back now, finally, to astrodensity profiling, it really is comparing the number that you measure from the transit to the density that you measure through some other way. So in principle, you would hope that these two numbers, one measured from the transit and one measured in some independent way, would agree with each other, right? But in reality, there are actually lots of ways in which these two numbers can disagree with one another. So for example, one of the reasons why this might happen is that during that little toy derivation we just did together, I assumed that the planet was on a circular orbit. But in fact, planets are quite often on elliptical orbits. Okay, so if I don't know that, and I sort of assume by default that the planet's on a circular orbit, even though its true orbit is elliptical, I will measure, apparently, a mean stellar density from the transit which strongly disagrees with that of the independent measure. But that's actually useful because that tells the astronomer looking at the comparison of these two numbers that there might be evidence here for an eccentric orbit. So you can kind of think of this comparison as being like a litmus test for how interesting this planetary system is. If the two numbers agree with each other, then it's probably a boring average vanilla system. But if they strongly disagree with each other, that's telling us astronomers that something interesting is going on here. So it could be because of orbital eccentricity, but there's actually many other reasons as well. And I'll put a link down in the description below with a whole sort of cartoon list of all of the effects which can do this. One of the other important ones I'll briefly mention is that if you have a binary or trinary star system, you actually aren't sure which star really has the transiting object going around it. So then I'm comparing one density of a star compared to what might be a completely different star. And in those cases, of course, there can be a really big difference. So in that case, this test actually helps astronomers to validate or prove that these planetary candidates are real planets. And that's one of the techniques we use to make that determination. So hopefully I've given you a sense that despite the scary name of astrodensity profiling, it really is a fairly simple technique and yet a very powerful one for exoplanet astronomers. So certainly myself and the rest of the Cool Worlds lab here, we actually use this technique quite often in our analysis of exoplanet data. And indeed, I was actually one of the people that helped develop the theory behind interpreting these differences earlier on in my career. This is definitely one of the more technical videos that we shot for the Coolworks Lab, so well done for getting through this. I'm actually really interested to hear your thoughts below about what you thought about this video. If you have any questions on this video, then of course please do put them in the comments below and we will get back to you. As always, thank you so much for watching this video, we really do appreciate it. If you want to make sure you get all the videos from the Coolworks Lab, make sure you click the subscribe button below. Please do like and share etc this video with all your friends. So thanks again and stay curious.